I bumped into Professor Mark Durkin yesterday. Uh, Mark, of course, is famed for being the co-author of my book, The Seven Principles of Digital Business Strategy, which, of course, you've read. And we got talking over some breakfast about what is the balance between strategy, person, technology, pull. How much time should be spent on getting the strategy right? How much should be inspired by technologies? So I just, I just walked past the man, uh, <laughs> monologuing, thinking that uh, some stranger here, he'll never know who it is. So here we are in the lovely gardens of Lady Dixon Park, just in South Belfast. I asked Mark to have a chat with me. Mark, have you got any opening thoughts on this? Because I have so many points that I would want to make, but you're, you're the smart one here. <laughs> so oh no, it's, it, it's a really, I think it's a very pertinent question for where businesses are now. Uh, traditionally you would have had strategy pull where you would have really focused your strategy around what the customer needs but in the speed with which we're seeing technology emerge now we're actually seeing the customer as um, innovator if you like so they're not actually clear at any one point in time what yeah. they want that technology to do for them yeah. and that then makes it very difficult for the business to respond with a three to five year strategic plan because things are just moving too quickly. Here's my take on it. There's no such thing as a three to five year strategic plan. Not anymore. No. Uh, Not okay, anymore. Glad, glad to hear that. What I'm finding now is that organisations that are writing three to five year strategic plans, what they are is the best is a vision. And what's what's worse is that they don't, they're typically written for the person above. So in government, they're written for the funder. Mm. And so the person underneath has nothing to go by. It's not actually a plan of action. It's a vision that, that they can reverse in, engineer anything to say, well, I'm mm. meeting that vision. Yeah. It doesn't diagnose the problem. And they're not data centric. Yes. They're, they're not outcome based with data. So they're therefore, again, reverse engineer anything you want mm -hmm. uh, into that. There's a couple of things in it for me. One is that with the speed of change and with the need for organizations to be so aware of how technology is impacting their business model, uh, potentially disrupting the way business has been done, that requires the vision piece to be in place because yes. I think you do have to need to know, you do know where, where you going. need to go. Yeah, yeah. It's the map through which you get from where you are now to that. That's yeah. the really difficult bit. And I think you almost need, um, in, in the 1980s, 1980s, early, early 90s, you would have had Tom Peters talking about empowering the front line. Yeah. In a way, those people who are closest to the customer are even more valuable now because they will be at that touch point as to where technology is impacting the people they deal with every day. And if we don't improve the communication and the feedback loop from those people at the front line of your organization back up to those more remote decision makers, yeah. we're going to be in real trouble. Yeah. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to, going to go for a dander here because I want to ask you about that. Because every time I ask salespeople what it is that the customer wants, they're absolutely sure that they know. And funnily enough, it's more salespeople and more resources from the salesperson, which is, goes counterintuitively to automation. Yeah. We should remove yeah. our, our, the use of data and insights to actually look at what our customers actually doing from a digital perspective. Yeah. And so I want to challenge it just a little bit. I fear that if we say you've got to have the people who, who are on the front line, they are tainted with their own self-preservation. And that, that's kind of inevitable because you always will be. But what that feedback loop to the decision maker further up the organization does, it allows them to take that into account. So Mark, here's, here's the bit, and I know you're probably gonna quote some piece of theory at me where I think I've discovered something. This is what happens to us all the time. <laughs> I think I've discovered something fabulous, a fabulous insight, Mark. And then I read it. And then yeah, you come up with a paper from 1932 or something where- That I've written. That you, <laughs> <laughs> that you've written, of course, 1932. Anyway, look, we were we were gabbling on there about um, about this data and data-driven insights. You know, this whole idea that I'm finding it's actually come goes around to culture, because when we talk about digital transformation in particular, and the moving of leadership to data-driven insights, it's a very difficult it's a very difficult thing for leaders to to get to grasp. With the, they they find that. Um, it's old habits die hard. When I was talking to a leader there recently, he said, it's not that he has to learn or doesn't understand what we're teaching. It's the letting go of the decision-making processes of the past. Mm -hmm. How do you find that balance between trying to tell people to move into data-driven decision-making mm -hmm. and 
then still allowing their experience and their skills to come mm. through and making sure that the culture of data-driven decision-making comes to the yeah. fore. I think you're right. It's a cultural piece. Yeah. Um, and I think any major change initiative like the one that is now incumbent on organisations, yeah, given um, the amount of technological change that we're all facing to the existing business models, that's going to require a huge effort. And you were saying, you know, making people realise these things, making people won't work. It's going to be about evidencing the fact that the technology and the data-driven insights allow for improved revenues, improved margin, better business processes. That's what's going to drive the adoption, not telling them. So I think it's about really yes, evidencing, yes, you know, yes. how the technology is adding value to your business and to their role in that business that is actually going to encourage the adoption and embedding. It's not just adoption, it's the embedding of that in how you do that business. That's going to be the critical piece. Here's my conclusion question to you, and we need to keep it short because everybody's starting to yawn at the other side of the YouTube channel here, I can tell. Is if you were to advise a leader in a soundbite hmm. as to how much, what percentage of their efforts should be in understanding and being encouraged and enthused and inspired by emerging technology? Before I give them a percentage, I would say they would have to come up with themselves, but I would say make sure your thinking is around what the customer wants to do with the technology, yeah, not yeah. what the technology can do in and of itself. I think that's the second video. I think we need to make another video on that. So the, more, the more you can think about that balance, contextually then you think about your business in the context that, that you're operating with your competitors and your customers and all those forces that are happening, and that will lead you to how much time you should be spending strategizing versus thinking about the technology. But, you, but they're, inter they're interdependent. Mm -hmm. You cannot develop your strategy in today's world without that being infused with the whole technological architecture that's around your business. Mm -hmm. And can you outsource? Can you outsource it? That's that's the key. Like I'm going into businesses and then I have technology experts. They're brilliant at AWS, mm. they're brilliant at data science, but you're now asking them almost to come up with a strategic plan for your organization and you're going, yeah. what, these people have never run an organization or even studied leadership yeah, or strategy yeah, yeah, or yeah, anything. Yeah, yeah. And now you're saying, well, the word digital's in there and I don't understand digital. Yeah. yeah Are we yeah, saying yeah. that it's time to, to pony up and learn digital? For, for digital to work and transform in your organization, it's your organization. Yeah. The, the yeah. People from outside that organization have a different agenda, different ex different experiences, That's right. different views. And no, that might be valuable and you can, you can take that for what it is and adapt it, but don't be enslaved by it. Yeah. My, my bias would be much more towards enabling the culture of your organization to be much more in tune with that technological landscape than insourcing or outsourcing some expertise that's going to really help you. Agreed, agreed, agreed. Okay, there we have it. We were unable to get a straightforward answer from Mark <laughs> as to what percentage. I, I run this uh, experiment every time we do a, a digital transformation course with the leaders, and it usually starts off with people say about 80% of the time should be on strategic uh, push and 20% on technology pull. And then we go through the whole idea of, well, what happens if you didn't understand about what data science can do? How would that inspire if you didn't spend time understanding it? And then usually you see a shift to around about 70, 30. Like it's just, a, it's just a heuristic. It's not a, it's by no means a mathematical calculation that somebody should adhere to. But the more people start to understand and get inspired by the technology, the more they shift. The reality, however, is that we then do a show of hands about how much of your resources go into technology pull versus strategy push. And it is so disproportionately rewarded to the technology pull, even though everybody just said it should really be strategically pushed or driven. Um, so it seems that I don't think no matter what percentage you go for, the reality is that we over-resource technology uh, and over-rely on the technology and we don't have the right skills and leadership to encourage data-driven decision-making and st more strategic push. Would you yeah, disagree? Agree. No, I, I would probably say we, we might over-resource um, technology, but we also under-resource strategy. Yeah, yeah, there we go. There's a agreed, agreed, two gentlemen's agreement. <laughs> Thank you very much for watching. Cheers next week.